You know, there's something special about you. There's something special about me. There's something special about the human race. Uh, We live on this planet that is filled with lots of amazing species of animals and fish and birds and, and all of this. But there's something about being human that separates all of us from all of them. It's, it literally, there's, there's a difference between uh, humanity and the rest of the animal kingdom. I know scientifically we're classified as part of the animal kingdom, but we're different. We're different. And, uh, and the reason we know that is because the Bible teaches us that. The Bible teaches that humanity uh, possesses something that, that animals do not. It's not just the breath of life. All the creatures on earth have what the Bible calls the breath of life makes them able to, to reproduce and to be alive, okay? But humans possess a soul, a soul. And, you know, us humans, we tend to anthropomorphize, that's a fancy word for assigning human feelings to things that don't have human feelings, and human characteristics of things that do not have human characteristics. We, we do this to our animals. We anthropomorphize animals. We anthropomorphize plants and Everything we we just do it as part of our as part of who we are as as humans. Uh, we'll we'll do things like we'll have a, we'll have a dog that comes up and uh, and begins to lick us, and we think, oh, the dog is kissing me. He this dog just loves me. Look look how much the dog just wants to kiss me and adore me, and we we're anthropomorphizing the dog. The dog's not kissing you. I'm sorry, it's licking you because when they were a puppy, they learned that if they lick their mom, they'll get more food. They lick around the face, they get some of the crumbs, okay? It's a learned behavior. And, and we, we just, we kiss them back, and it's a real kiss from us. And we just adore them and love on them. And, and so they learn, wow, if I want attention from my master, I just need to lick more, okay? It has nothing to do with kissing. They, they don't know what that means, okay? It doesn't mean it's not affectionate, okay? It just means it's not quite a kiss like we think it is. Uh, sometimes if you, maybe you're not a dog person, maybe you're a cat person, don't, don't admit that here. But if you're a cat person, sometimes your cat will come up and start licking you too. And you think, oh, they love me so much. They're, they're cleaning me. No, they're tasting you. Just in case they can start to take a bite while you're sleeping. I mean, cat, cats, are, they're just always playing in your demise. And that's what they're doing. So when they're licking you, they're just like, one day, one day. And uh, some animals... Some animals that we, we love to, you know, we watch the National Geographic and, and, and uh, all these, these shows on television and, and documentaries and what have you. And we see animals like elephants, for example, that they, they appear to be very intelligent as far as creatures go. And uh, they even grieve over the loss of members of their family. And uh, that's, that's very fascinating. Uh, we, we see uh, dolphins that act like they want to communicate with us for some reason. If they were really smart, they probably wouldn't. But, you know, they, the dolphins, they, they, want, they, they seem like they want to communicate with us and be friends with us. Uh, we even have gorillas that learn sign language and talk and say, I'm hungry, feed me, or, you know, I'm having a bad day. I need a hug, you know, whatever. So you, we see uh, these kinds of things in animals, and it's interesting. It's interesting. And none of them, however, can surpass the complexity of the human mind. None of them uh, can reach into the depths of emotion like we do. None of them have the ability to do self-reflection to the level that a human does. And something very interesting that, that, I, that I learned is that none of the animal kingdom has the ability to do something that we do, and that is to shed tears. To shed tears. Uh, it is entirely and totally human to cry and to shed tears. Animals do not do that. If they appear to grieve or mourn, they do it in other ways. But they do not shed emotional tears like humans do. It's fascinating. Crying and shedding tears is part of the human experience. And it begins the very day we're born. We start life crying a lot. I remember when my children were born, uh, especially my firstborn, he came out mad. (laughs) He exited the womb, and he had a look of just sheer anger on his face. I'm like, wow, this is really something. You know, I'm like, I didn't know what to expect. It's the first time I've ever seen anything like that. 
and they, they turned this, this baby over just as he exited the womb, and I, and I saw this just this wrinkled up, mad face, and he started letting out this cry, and I thought, wow, he is, he is very, very unhappy. <laughs> Give that boy to me. Let's make him happy. And so as we experience life as, as humans, as we grow up and we mature, uh, we may find ourselves uh, shedding more and more tears. We, we find ourselves, this is part of the human condition. Uh, a lot of times that happens when something sad or tragic occurs. You may be thinking of something right now. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not trying to bring you down. Uh, but th- things happen that are sad or tragic and, and it brings tears to our eyes. And uh, sometimes we see really beautiful things. And we see just truly beautiful things. And sometimes that brings a little tear to the corner of the eye. And if you're a manly man, it's just like, oh, I got something in my eye. I'm not crying, just dust. Like, I saw this beautiful thing, and suddenly, it's like dust just went straight into my eye. It's weird how that works. Uh, Sometimes we're struck by acts of selflessness, heroism, patriotism, uh, ultimate sacrifice. Uh, Or even, sometimes we think back to when we were children, uh, and and we have these memories of when we were children, and, and just the nostalgia might cause your eyes to water a little bit. Or, or maybe when you, uh, when you have children and you remember when they were children and your, your heart is just filled with this fondness and, and, so you're, and you just kind of feel it right up here in your eyeballs. You, know, you feel it in your heart, but you also feel it in your eyeballs. You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? This is totally human. We, as far as we know, animals cannot do this. And if you live life long enough and hard enough, you might, you might even cry in the middle of a movie. You know, for the longest time, I, I, watched, some, I watched a lot of movies, and, I, and I, there's only one movie that ever made me cry as I was growing up. It's called Where the Red Fern Grows. You ever see that movie? Now, I watched that movie as a boy, and I said, I will never watch that movie again. That, that did something to me that just, like, that is not manly. That is not <laughs> tough. Like, it just it stirred emotions in me that I, I, as a boy, I didn't even know that I had. And I thought, I don't want to ever feel that way again. I, I don't want to. I don't want to have a dog. I don't want to love two dogs. I, nothing. Like, that's just they just they leave. <laughs> and then a few years later, I watched it again, and the exact same thing. I've never watched it again. I said this time, you know, first time, you know, I didn't know. Second time, I knew better. Shame on me. I'm not doing it a third time. I'm not watching that movie again. It made me cry. It, who, who has a movie that's made you cry? Anybody had, had a movie that makes you cry? Well, just shout it out. What is it? Oh, Still magnolias. We're going back a little ways. Still Magnolia. What else? Oh, old Yeller. Oh, that's the other one. I don't ever want to watch Old Yeller again. Oh, my goodness. Poor, poor Old Yeller. What, what, what is it? Saving Private Ryan. See, that's heroism and patriotism and self-sacrifice. See what I'm talking about? Yeah. I, for the longest time, I did not cry in movies uh, and until I experienced some hardships in life. You know, once you've been down to the bottom and you've been drugged around emotionally, uh, once you're opened up to those kinds of things, you, you, uh, you know, have a little more emotion, a little easier. And I remember the first movie that I cried at as a man. It was called Cinderella Man. It was Cinderella Man. It's a true story about a boxer who is okay. He's an okay boxer and um, falls on hard times during the Depression. And no longer is boxing. He's just, his body's beat down. He's just not really good enough to make it to the top. And, and so he, but he, he can't find work. Every, everybody's poor. And he finds himself trying to provide for his family. And he ends up going to this room filled with the rich people that he used to hobnob with all the time. And he has his hat in his hand. And because they respected him as a fighter and his character, they just began to put money in his hat. And he began just to go, and this, this strong, capable man who only wanted to make sure that his kids had food to eat was reduced to begging for money. And when I saw that, and, that, and knowing, knowing that it's a true story on top of that, it struck a nerve with me. And I just, I mean, I was wiping tears the rest of the time. And then, then he really got me when he started fighting and uh, he, got, he got back into it. There was a champion that needed uh, somebody to beat up on so he could be, can, uh, still be champion. And, but he needed a name that people recognized, and so they called him. They called him the Cinderella Man. He wasn't the Cinderella Man yet. But he, he, he said, okay, I'll do it because there's money in it. And he gets up and he wins. 
and then he wins again, and he keeps winning. And they have an interview they did with him, and you can go back, it's a, it's a real thing. He goes back and they do this interview with him, and they say, uh, what's different now? Because you, you, like, you were a pretty decent boxer before, but now it's like you're at another level. And he says, well, now I know what I'm fighting for. And he said, what, are you, what is that? What are you fighting for? He said, milk. And it just, I'm telling you, it just broke me. It just broke me. Here's a man. He just wants to provide for his family. I'm like, I have a family. <laughs> I'd fight for my family too. You know what I mean? You know what I mean. You, we all have movies like that. Yeah. Crying, shedding tears is this human thing. It's a, and it's a sign that you are deeply connected to the moment. That's what I want. I'm not trying to make you cry today. Okay, I'm just, I'm just, I'm talking about crying. Okay, crying and shedding tears is the sign that you are deeply connected to the moment. Uh, maybe when you're sharing something hard with a friend, or, or and you're you're sitting in the in the the office of a therapist or whatever, and you're and you're talking through uh, trauma and tragedy that's happened in your life. And, and things that you're struggling with. And maybe your friend or maybe even your therapist is just sitting there listening so intently. And, and you see a, a tear form in their eye and then roll down their cheek. And you think to yourself, wow. I, I knew they were listening. But they're like, they're going beyond listening. They're like really connecting with me. They're, there's real empathy here. They, down on some deeper level, they've connected with the story that I'm telling. You ever had that happen? You ever, you ever, you're talking to somebody or they're talking to you and you just feel that welling up inside and, and you're, you're just connected to them. You're, you're empathizing with them in such a powerful way. And tears are powerful that way. Uh, tears, tears have marked uh, some of the greatest leaders in the world history. Okay? So as you study the, the great leaders of the world, uh, you can find many leaders who at various times have shed tears openly. And I'm just going to, I'll talk about just a couple of them here. First of all, Winston Churchill. You may have known his name from history. The leader of Great Britain during World War II. Uh, Stalwart, strong, had some amazing speeches that he did. And really uh, just, you know, leading Britain through terrifying and terrible times of war. And he was known, as he said, I like to blub a lot. He was just known as a crier. Okay, that's what they call crying over there, I guess, is blubbing. So he, he blubbed a lot, and he was known for it. In fact, uh, he was known for his iron resolve, but also his frequent tears. One of his secretaries actually made a list of the things that brought tears to his eyes because it was such an extensive list. He cries a lot. It's things like uh, he would hear an account of uh, men from Great Britain fighting in the, on the front lines and dying in battle and giving their lives heroically, and as they would read the account, he would cry. And uh, he would hear stories. They would, they would read the news stories to him of, of people in London standing in long lines just to get bird seed to feed their pet canaries. And he would cry. Or he'd hear the story of, of, uh, of this just great loving dog that was just working so hard through the snow to get to his master. And he would just cry. He loved animals. He loved his people, and he wasn't afraid to show it through his tears. You take somebody like a Martin Luther King Jr., who we know is a, such a strong figure, powerful speaker, a great leader, civil rights, a champion. And he, he, was, he would deliver these, these powerful speeches, very strong and dynamic and really incredible. And he took a trip to Ghana, the nation of Ghana, and he, he watched as the nation of Ghana gained their independence. He watched as one flag of the old regime was lowered and the new independent flag of Ghana was raised. And this is what he said. He said, before I knew it, I started weeping. I was crying for joy. And I knew about all the struggles and all the pain and all the agony that these people had gone through for this moment. This was the birth of a new nation. And when he saw that, he was moved to openly weeping. It's pretty amazing. And then we get biblical. One of the great leaders, the Apostle Paul, he was uh, talking to the elders of the Ephesus church. He had called them to him, and it's written now in Acts chapter 20 and 31, and he's admonishing them as he's kind of nearing 
the end of his ministry, and he says, I want you to be alert, remembering that for three years, elders of Ephesus, I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. I taught you, I taught you the things of God. I taught you, I taught you about the kings of the, the things of the kingdom. I, I taught you these things with, with tears. Day and night for three years, I labored among you. I taught you. I was so connected to you. Don't forget that. Because there's going to come false teachers. And they're not going to come with tears. They're going to come with their wallets open. They're going to come looking for a pulpit and power and prestige. They're going to come in with strange ideas that aren't what I taught you. Remember, remember the one that connected with you so deeply. Remember the one that taught you so well. Don't forget, I taught you with tears. You see, the tears of our leaders, they show the desire of their hearts and how tender-hearted they are. And that can make them even more effective. That's probably why uh, even modern-day politicians are known to try and cry at just the right moment. You know, they just try, they'll try to, just at the right moment, shed a little tear, and it becomes a political weapon, even. And we, we, you know, we're smart enough, we see through those things. I hope you are. Because tears are very powerful. Even our own tears, as we think about uh, what happens in our body when we cry, uh, when we begin to cry, and I mean like really cry, and those tears really begin to roll down, it activates something called our parasympathetic nervous system. And this parasympathetic nervous system actually triggers the body to rest. Oh, you, you need to rest. Like you, anybody ever reach the end of your rope and you just like, you know what? I can't handle this more. I'm just, I, and you just like, I just cry. I can't take it anymore. Boo hoo, boo hoo, boo hoo, boo hoo. And you just blub everywhere. Okay? And then you feel better. Well, you activated your parasympathetic nervous system, and now your body's like, okay, I gotta calm down. It's too much to handle. It's like literally a chemical thing that happens in your body when you cry. When you cry, it actually releases chemicals in your body, like oxytocin and endorphins that, that dull pain, physical pain and emotional pain. It's just a, you, you, when you cry, you literally get high a little bit and it dulls the pain. It dulls the senses and it lets you cope better with whatever you're going through when you cry. And holding it in doesn't do that. That just stretches you more. But when you let it out, when you, when you expose what's inside, uh, that actually can bring a little rest and a little healing and a little better coping. It, it actually, sometimes you hold things in so long, so much frustration, so much pain, so, so much everything, and you, oh, just, it, it finally eats away at you. And, and it's like the, if you thought of your, your mental health as like a, a balance, a scale hanging in the balance, you're, you're tilted way to one side, and eventually, eventually it just can't go anymore and it just goes the other way. And then once everything gets dumped off the other end, then you know, it goes back and forth and you find equilibrium. Okay? So it's good to be able to talk about things that are inside so that you don't get to that place where everything is so out of balance. But sometimes you just need a good crying session. It's true. It's true. And you're like, what a strange message today. What a strange message. And nobody here is crying, so that's good. Okay? It's just interesting so far, right? It's just interesting. Yes. Your tears are also powerful in prayer. There's an ancient... A Jewish rabbi who wrote this, he said, there are three degrees of prayer. This is his thoughts. Each surpassing the other, and that is you have prayer, you have crying, and you have tears. Prayer can be made in silence even. Crying with a loud voice, but tears surpass all. Have you ever been there in prayer? Sometimes you can just sit and think and meditate about the Word of God, and it can be pleasing to you. And uh, sometimes You can pray silently. You can even uh, just speak to God in a normal tone and just pray. And there's other times where you cry out to God. And there's other times you cry before God. And each of those are a different kind of connection to God. Each of those are important. Each of those are powerful. There's something about when you begin to shed tears. Uh, and so I can just tell you, uh, as, a, as a man who prays, I, I have wept in prayer. Uh, I, I weep over my family sometimes when I think about my boys. 
and I think about the life that they are going to lead, the world they're going to grow up in, the connection that I want them to experience with God. I think about all the things that's against them, all the things they have going for them, and it's just too much for me to bear. And so sometimes I just weep over my children. Sometimes I weep over my own self. <laughs> you know, like, God, why? Why have I not gotten better at this? Or why am I not... Why do I have to keep dealing with that? Or well, have you even heard me, you know, in, in, in these needs that I have? Uh, if you're part of this church and you've ever submitted a prayer request, if, if you're a leader, if, you're, in, if, I, if I know your name, I've probably wept over you in this church. And if you're sitting here and you don't know my name, I've probably, or if I don't know your name, I've probably wept over you too. Because I think about all the people in this city that need to have a church to belong to, and that need healing in their lives, that need connection and friendship, but also that need a powerful move of the Holy Spirit in their life. And I want them to experience it so much. And sometimes, sometimes I, I weep even over the people that I don't, I don't know. I just know they live around here. And I'm, God, how can I reach them? How, how, can I, how can I get the word out that this is a place where they can experience you? This is a place where they can connect. And so... And I weep, I weep over our church sometimes, uh, over your individual needs, but also over the needs that we have as a body. I want, I want people to be healed in this, in this place. I, I want people to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want people's, the trajectory of their life to be changed. And I see people come in sometimes and their hearts are so hard towards God. They're just, they're just here because they have to be. And I'm like, God, I just, I don't know how to get through to them. And, and I, I want them to experience you like I have experienced and even more. And sometimes it just brings tears. It's powerful prayers when that happens. It's biblical. It's biblical. Psalm 34 and 17 says, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And Psalm 55 and 17 says, Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint. Anybody got any complaints for God? He's big enough to handle them. It's actually biblical to bring him your complaints. And moan. Anybody ever do that before? You're just, just whining and complaining and moaning before God. He hears my voice, it says. He hears my voice. So through our tears in these times, we break down emotional walls. This is what happens. A lot of times we try to hold that stuff back. Oh, I don't want to show any emotion. I don't want to go there. I'm, I'm, just going to, I'm just going to sit right here. Thank you very much. And I'll listen and find it interesting. But I don't want to break down any walls. I don't, I don't want there to, I, I don't want to like really open up. Okay. God wants you to open up. When, when we get to the point in prayer where the tears are flowing, then we've broken down some emotional walls. We've broken down some walls of control and walls of pride. And, and now you find ourselves open fully to the moving of the Holy Spirit. And we can find ourselves connected to God in ways that we never could have connected before when we allow ourselves to get to the place where the tears begin to flow. God wants to connect with you today. And so I, I've said all of that, all, all of that interesting stuff uh, to bring you to my very first point. And that is this. The tears of humanity represent a connection to the deepest parts of ourselves. When you see your tears, the deepest parts of yourself are open to connection. And so with that thought in mind, with that first point that I made, I spent, spent some, some time talking about that. And with all of that in mind, I want to now turn to Jesus. Because I want you to see a real miracle. I want you to see the links that God will go to connect with you. I'm telling you, God wants to connect with you in a powerful way today. I want you to see it. I want you to see this. And in the Old Testament, God would often appear to people. He would appear as what the Bible calls the angel of the Lord. These are theophanies. That's the, the scholarly word for it. A theophany is a temporary appearance of God, usually in the form of an angel or a man, and, or a burning bush in the case of Moses. 
Okay, And so the Lord would appear to prophets or to leaders. He appeared to Gideon, for example. He appeared to the parents of Samson, for example. We see this in Scripture over and over again. But there are some unique interactions out of all these theophanies in the Old Testament. There's some unique ones that kind of take it to another level. All the theophanies are interesting, but there's some that are just like above the others. They're, they show us that God is not just the kind of God who shows up sometimes and talks. He's not just a God that like sits back and, and waits for just the right time and then he jumps in and says, I have a word for you, here it is, and then he leaves again. But that he's not just observing us, performing miracles and then leaving. No, sometimes God shows through these theophanies that he is willing to go to great lengths to connect with us. Yeah. He's willing to do something that is above what you might expect to connect with us. Uh, for example, we read the story of Job, and Job is interesting. There's many chapters in the book of Job. It's probably my least favorite book. In, I shouldn't say that. My, my least favorite book in the Bible is Job. I do read it. I don't like it. Okay? Read it, and you'll know why. Okay? That's some bad stuff that happens to Job. And then Job starts arguing with God. Like, he gets in a debate with God. And you know what God does? He says, just talk to the hand. No, God debates back. He is, it's like, it's this, it's this miracle debate. It's a, I mean, think about that. The God of the universe is arguing with a man. That's a miracle. You think about that. God cares enough to actually argue with him. I, I hear all your complaints, Job. Well, what about this? Well, what about this, God? Well, this is... Think about this, Job. And finally, Job, you know, he just keeps escalating and God finally just lays a smack down on him and finishes the debate. But the fact that he has this argument and the fact that he has this debate is a miracle. It's a, this, is, this is just showing you God, God wanted to connect with Job so much that he says, I'm, I'm willing to be, I'm willing to kind of step down off the throne, so to speak, and argue with you and speak to you. Back and forth, hear your complaints. That's a miracle. Okay, that's a miracle. There's a story where he wrestled with Jacob. Jacob, one of the fathers of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the big three right there in Jewish history. He wrestled with Jacob. God wrestled with a man, not mentally, not emotionally, physically. You think, well, that should have been an easy wrestling match. But he let it go on all night long. He wrestled with him. That's why. He's, he's, trying, he's connecting with Jacob the way that Jacob needs to be connected. Jacob was a wrestler. He wrestled from the time he was in the womb. He came out holding his twin brother's foot. No, you're not going ahead of me. No, going, you got ahead of me. I'm going to figure out another way to get ahead of you. That's just, that was Jacob, and that's how God connected with him. You want to wrestle, big boy? Let's wrestle. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, it's a little testosterone speaking. Huh. It was a miracle match. You know, you got all these wrestling matches, cage matches, ladder matches, barbed wire matches. This is a miracle match right here. God going to great lengths. He doesn't do anywhere else to connect with somebody that he thought was so special. When it comes to people like Abraham and Moses, he made a covenant with Abraham, and he, he had this friendship with Moses where Moses could actually speak to him face-to-face, -face, like the Bible says, like a friend. There is nobody that spoke for God like Moses until Jesus came along. It was pretty amazing the relationship that he had with Moses. So he, would, he appeared to Moses over and over and over again. He, he appeared to Abraham like a man, sat in his tent, ate his food, drank his drinks with him, talked, talked to him about what he was going to do, made promises to him, hung out in his tent. I mean, you don't see God doing that in other places in the Bible. It's special. God, God's like, you know what? I'm going to great lengths to connect with you, Abraham. I'm going to great lengths to connect with you, Moses. But then he went further. He became 
Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, infinite God, not appearing as a man, as it was with Abraham and Moses and the others, but God as a man. And that's the, that's the real miracle there. God, not just appearing as a man, not just God moving on a man, not God moving through a man, God as a man. The essence, the nature, the personality of God pressed into flesh. That's the scriptures. The express image of his person. That's what Jesus is. God is not too big to get down on our level. God is not too big that he can't stoop down to where we are. In fact, he wants to do that and he has done that. He will meet us right where we are. He will meet you right where you are. He will connect with you the way you need to be connected with in the deepest part of you. He came as Jesus Christ. He came as Jesus Christ as a man so that he could meet us in our hunger. Jesus got hungry. He can meet us in our tiredness. He can meet us in our sorrow. And in his sorrow, he wept. He wept. The deepest part of God was revealed when he wept. Miracle tears. Miracle tears. The deepest levels of emotion, God experienced them. And when he experienced them, he wept. And his tears revealed his heart. I want to uh, move quickly through a couple of places where Jesus cried. Three places in Scripture where Jesus shed tears. I want to go through them with you. Two of them quickly, and then one I'm going to dwell on for just a moment. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. Jesus sitting out, looking at the city of Jerusalem. And as he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. He, he wept. Jesus wept over the unbelievers in the city. Jesus wept over the sinners in the city. Jesus wept over those that thought they had it all figured out, but they didn't, and they were missing him. They were missing the whole point that he, that he came to make. And he wept over them. If you are far from God today, if you are an unbeliever in the house today, God has wept over you. He shed tears over you because he knows, he knows what could be. And you don't know it yet. But that's how he feels about you. Reveals his heart. Hebrews chapter 5 and 7 says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. And this is referring to his prayer, Jesus' prayer life, but also his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross. Uh, he was filled with fear. It's hard to wrap your mind around that God, wrapped in flesh, would experience fear, but he knew he was about to die. And, of course, that releases all sorts of chemicals into your body. He experienced all of that, just like we would, and it brought him to tears. And then he prayed for his disciples because he knew what they were going to go through. And he prayed that they would be spared. He prayed that they would be saved. He prayed that their faith wouldn't fail. And when he prayed for them, he wept. His heart, his heart was to please God. And his heart was to do the will of God. And his heart was for his disciples and those that would follow them. Jesus wept. Then, there's a story of Lazarus. I'm going to move quickly through it. It's found in John chapter 11. And it's very interesting. It says this, now, a certain man was ill. A certain man, a particular man, was ill. He was sick. Lazarus of Bethany names him. He lived in the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was the same Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother, Lazarus, was ill. So they're related to each other. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They knew each other. Jesus actually went here 
over and over and over again. This is like the place he liked to hang out. Jesus hung out at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. That was his favorite spot. Verse 5, it says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Loved all of them. Those are his friends. And he heard that Lazarus was ill. And when he heard, the Bible says in verse 6, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now that seems kind of strange. My friend is very sick, and they've asked me to come and to be with him and to heal him. So I'm just going to wait a couple of days. Some friend, Jesus. Some friend. He stayed two days longer, and then after that, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. Jesus knew Lazarus was going to die. In fact, he actually said his death is going to be for the glory of God. And so after Lazarus had been dead for four days, we get to verse 20, and he's approaching Bethany. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. Mary remained seated in the house. You know, I don't want to see him. I want to talk to Jesus right now. You, you go talk to him. I'm going to stay here in the house. Because he could have been here. Okay. I don't know if you ever felt that way about Jesus. Martha, Martha makes it to Jesus and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I mean, pretty straight. That's how you know they're friends. See how they, they just talk to Jesus like that? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She's got a little hope. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I don't think, I don't think you're quite getting what I'm saying, Martha. I, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe you're the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher's here and he's calling for you. So when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but he was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, so there are other people there too, saw that knew Jesus and knew Martha and Mary and Lazarus. When they saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. And when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Where have we heard that before? Just a few verses ago. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. This, the the he, uh, Greek here is very interesting. It talks about... He was moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Uh, the English just doesn't really do it justice. There's this, uh, there, it, it actually, uh, according to some scholars, it's more like he's trying to fight back tears. It's like, oh, I hate this. And he sees them weeping and, and he starts to feel the tears forming in his eyes and he, he's like, he's fighting against that. And so he says, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And then he can't hold it back anymore. Verse 35, the shortest verse in the entire Bible. Jesus wept. It's interesting. We read this story. We look at our lives. We look at the tragedies that happen in our lives. We look at the, the troubles that we're in in our lives. And we can get so lost in our search for meaning. Like, why is this happening to me? I, I, know, I know God has allowed this. You know, but why would he allow this? So what's the meaning? How's he going to get the glory in this? Uh, uh, what is it that he's trying to do? Uh, you know, what, what's his big plan? What's the big idea here? Like, what's, what's going on? We get so caught up in that, and it's not wrong to ask those kinds of questions. And we see that with Mary and Martha as well. I mean, it's obvious that God knows something we don't. I mean, Jesus was very intentional about waiting for Lazarus to die. That was like, it was on purpose. Oh, we get so caught up in trying to find meaning in, in these tragedies and traumas and, and all of this. And some of it you may never actually know in this life. We forget the most important part about all of it. And it's this connection that God has with us in the middle of this. 
We get so caught up in our own feelings. We get so caught up in, well, there must be some other higher purpose. We forget that Jesus is actually here. And look at this with Martha and Mary. They both said the same thing to Jesus. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. His response was different to each one of them. Martha says, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus knew where she was at. He knew that she was coming at this from a theological bent. Well, but I also know that you can do whatever God sent you to do. And he, so he starts talking to her about the resurrection and the life and who he really is. And he meets her right where she is. Yeah, he gives her the connection that she needed. Yeah. She needed to hear something theological. She got something theological. Mary, Mary, she was too heartbroken to even try to understand Mary, she was almost accusatory. She's like, my brother, he'd still be here if you had been here. I don't understand. And instead of giving her some theological explanation, instead of explaining the big plan, instead of giving her this big reveal, I'm the resurrection and the life, Jesus wept. He had two more words with her. And Jesus could have rolled up very differently into Bethany. He knew Lazarus was going to die, and he knew he was going to raise Lazarus up. He could have walked in there very differently. He could have come. He could have walked in and be like, "All right, everybody, move out of the way. Show me, show me where he's at." He he could have been like, you know, just rolling me like, all right, I'm about to get this done. We're we're gonna I'm gonna show you who's I'm gonna show you who the resurrection of the life is. Y'all's all worried, but no reason to be worried. Jesus is here. He could have done that. That's not what he did. He wept. He could have looked at Mary and said, Mary, I love Lazarus. Mary, I love you. I'm sorry that Lazarus had to suffer. I'm sorry you had to watch Lazarus die. I'm sorry that you had to go through that. There's a bigger plan and I wish you could understand it. I wish wish you didn't have to suffer. I hate suffering and I hate sin and I, I hate what it does to my people, but I'm here now. He could have said that, but he just wept. And his tears spoke more than any of those words could ever speak. Here's point number two that I've taken you to so far today. In Jesus Christ, God has connected with us at our deepest level. The place where our joy lives, the place where sorrow is formed, he connected with us there and his tears are proof of that. He went there. He didn't have to. He went there. He connected to that deep place. And I think it's important for us to understand we do not serve a God who is only far off on heaven's throne watching us in our pain just to see what we'll do in some kind of cosmic test of faith. That's not what he's doing. He's not, he's not just sitting back and watching you sin and, and just shaking his head like, oh, there they go again. I can't believe it. No, he's, he's not doing that. He, he hates sin, yes, but he loves you. He's moved by you. There's this thought this wrong thought that gets in our hearts that in order to have this close relationship with Jesus, in order to have this close relationship with God, our maker, uh, we have to be okay. We have to get it all together before we come to Jesus. Uh, If you come to Jesus, you can't be a weeper and a whiner and a complainer and a I don't understander. Okay, You can't be like that and connect to God. That's not true. Hebrews 4 and 15 says, we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He's been there and he's done that and he's made the connection. I just want you to see today that God God didn't just show up in the form of a man just so that he could say, I came and I died and now I shed my blood for you and all this. He came and he experienced humanity at the deepest level so that he could have a connection with you at the deepest level. He's the Holy Spirit and he's around you. He's saturating you and he is with you. And he's always nudging you, prompting you. 
He's holding you through the pain. He's weeping alongside you and he's bringing you through. If you're not a believer in the room, he's also reaching for you. He's urging you. He's convicting you. He's patiently, maybe impatiently, waiting for you. When you turn to him, he will meet you right where you are. Uh, The fact that Jesus cried with us, the fact that Jesus cried for us is a miracle. It's miracle tears. But the best part is the rest of the miracle. Because Jesus, he doesn't cry forever. And neither will you. Neither will you. He cries with us, but he's not going to cry forever. Yes. Lazarus is going to come out of the tomb. You're going to come out of your darkest night. Your grief will not have the final say. He will wipe away every tear. He is with you. Today, I want to invite you to stand where you are. It's time to connect with God. At whatever level you're at. I've tried today to paint two points for you. One, our tears the deepest, reveal the deepest parts of ourselves. Two, God experienced the deepest parts of humanity so that he could connect with us there. Why did he do that? Because he wants to have a connection with you. Let's stand in the room today. He wants to have a connection with you. Wherever you are, whatever level you're at, he wants you to recognize the work that he has done to show you he wants to be connected to you. God wants to connect with you. And not some superficial thing, but some deep thing. He wants, to, he wants you to have an encounter with him in his presence. And it's time today to respond to his desire. Here's what we're going to do. I think it would be okay if you wanted to connect with God as well. Since God made steps towards you, you can take steps towards him. I'm going to open this area up front here. We'll call it the altar area. You can come, just stand, or kneel, or whatever you want to do. We're going to go into a time of worship, and I'm going to invite you to take a step of faith, a step of connection towards God. If you're an unbeliever, this could be the moment where you choose to become a believer. I'm going to step forward. I'm going to become a believer. I'm going to connect with God. And if you've already done that, you've begun to change your life, been to study his word, you can make the choice to be baptized in his name. To take on it. That's a deeper connection with God. And maybe today, right here, you could be filled with the baptism of his Holy Spirit as you open up to God and let him open up to you. And maybe you just need a refreshing in your spirit, refreshing in your soul, renewing in your mind. Or maybe there's some other next steps that God is wanting you to take. All of that can be revealed to you as you connect with Him intentionally, opening up to Him. I'm going to invite you right now, as the worship team begins to play, to begin to make your way forward. If you want to, if you want to connect with God today, I'm just going to invite you just to step forward today. I'm not going to have, there's not going to be anybody up here, you know, shaking you and crying over you and laying hands on you and doing and embarrassing you. Nothing, nothing, nothing like that's going to happen. You just, this is between you and God today. I'm going to invite you to come and to connect with God if that's your desire. He wants to connect with you. This isn't about, oh, I need to be saved. Oh, I'm a sinner. It's not like that. It just is, I want to connect with God today on a deeper level. I want, that, I want you to make that your prayer. Would you come and make that your prayer with me today? Would you join me down here in the front and just pray with me? God, as a church body, as an individual, I want to connect with you. Whatever you want to do in me, I want you to do that in me. I want you to have your way in me. Would you come? Let's go into worship. These altars are open for you to come and connect with God today. He wants to speak to you.